the Sam Hill's going on here? The Rewatch Podcast presents the Lois and Clark Rewatch. Dedicated to the series Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman on ABC. Join us each week as we investigate the origins of the Man of Steel and uncover crime in Metropolis. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast or follow us on Twitter at Rewatch Pod. Oh, hey, 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 let's get back to it. And welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast and our Lois and Clark Rewatch. I'm Corey. And I'm Paul. And I don't belong to no woman. <laughs> Take that, Linda and Lois. I'm my own man. <laughs> Independent man. <laughs> there you go. His nickname is Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everyone. We are here again, of course, discussing... Two more episodes of Lois and Clark, and this week's headline reads, Found Rival. And we are discussing Foundling and the Rival. So let's get straight into it here. Episode one today is Foundling, written by Daniel Levine and directed by Bill D'Elia. And this originally aired February 20th of 1994. Tell me more about this globe. It was in the ship that brought me to Earth. When Lois and I broke into Bureau 39's warehouse, I hid it from Lois. I never really knew that it was anything more than it seemed. Maps of Earth and Krypton. Until last night. But why now? You've had it for months. I don't know, Mom. Except that Jor-El said that it was attuned to me. So maybe it and I weren't supposed to be separated for so long. Maybe it just took a little while for it to warm up. Well, the people were uh, jor and Lara. Any memory of them at all? None. I've gone my entire life not knowing how or why I was left on your doorstep. There are so many questions left unanswered. What was Krypton like? Who were my parents? I mean, did everybody there have powers like me? Will I continue to age? Normally, can I die? Now I'm about to find out. Clark gets a call that his apartment has been robbed, and along with the normal everyday items that robbers take, also missing is the globe of Krypton he procured from the Bureau 39 warehouse. Aside from the globe being of sentimental value, it also had recently started causing Clark to see visions of his family and their final moments on Krypton, revealing to him his birth name of Kal-El. With some help from a friend of Lois's, he manages to track down the robbers, a young runaway named Jack and his little brother Ethan, but after they accidentally activated the globe and sold the globe unknowingly to Lex Luthor, who also managed to activate the globe and learn about Superman's past as a baby on the dying planet of Krypton. Luther later has Nigel bring Jack to him to find out where he had found the globe, but the globe activates again, which allows Superman to hone in on his location, prompting Luther to activate the self-destruct system to cover his escape, while the Man of Steel manages to stop the system and save Jack. Magnificent. See how the light catches its depth, Nitron? a perfect jewel. I want it analyzed atom by atom. As you wish, sir. We stand on the verge of an historic moment. Yes. I could feel the vibrations. Can you? The accumulated plunderings of a lifetime. The missing arms of the Venus de Milo, Gainsborough's Yellow Boy, Beethoven's Tenth Symphony. The better self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh. The full figure, Mona Lisa. Unknown, unseen by the world at large, they exist solely for my pleasure. And yet my private collection is incomplete. I am incomplete. No more. In many ways, Superman remains a mystery. And despite my many conflicts with him, I lack the knowledge, the wedge, to bend him to my will, to break him. But now, finally, 
this globe will change all that. Okay, so just the tiniest little bit in our investigation. Haven't uncovered much this week, really. Have we? Yeah, there's not too much. Uh, our reactions uh, went over the scripts and compared, and uh, basically the, the big things are there were some extra lines for Jarrell just here and there, nothing major except when uh, Jarrell uh, says kal name specifically and says that he will have powers that no Kryptonian has. So it sort of answers the question in the episode where Clark says, like, do they have powers like me you know are they just like this and it makes it more uh, like in the episode itself it makes it a little bit more mysterious because they don't answer that straight out so they cut that out and when Clark fi- realizes that his parents had saved him and not abandoned him he's supposed to be crying in the actual episode he's supposed to be like very teary eyed and his parents also you know tear up when they realize that he wasn't abandoned he was sent here because they didn't want him to die on Krypton kind of nice little touches but in, in the end you know nothing that changed the story really yeah and if they did have the abilities that he has, then that would be evident because they would obviously survive the planet exploding if they were exactly. as strong as him. So the yeah, fact, yeah exactly. the fact that they didn't use powers at all during the message and of course died when Krypton exploded, it's yeah, yeah. I think that's self explanatory, really, isn't it? Right. <laughs> I try to picture where you are now as you hear this last chapter. What do you look like? Are you alone? What have you become? Lara and I will never know. But that you should live to experience this, that is enough. We are content. We give you to Earth, to a realm called America, and a place called Kansas. Remember us. Do not regret our passing. All is fate. Okay, so getting into the main story. The big lead here is that, yes, indeed, the globe is glowing. (laughs) And Clark is getting his backstory as Jarrell goes full digs. (laughs) Totally full digs. (laughs) Way to go, Jarrell. We knew he had. We knew he had it in you. Yeah. So, what did you think of Jarrell, or should I say, David Warner making a oh, cameo yeah. appearance as Jarrell? Well, I love David Warner, so it was great to see him as Jarrell. I think he did a great job. I love, like, uh, I don't remember um, a lot of Smallville's Jarrell because I I started to tune out around when that started to to come about when Jarrell started to make his appearance. So I don't even know how the story really ended. I've seen like some spoilers here and there, but. I, I of all the Jarrells I've seen, you know, like Marlon Brando and the one that I sort of heard on Smallville, I like David Warner. I just like David Warner himself. Like, when he shows up in something, I enjoy him. He was in uh, that old, uh, it was an old movie. It might have been a TV movie. The uh, Was it The Lost Planet? It was about the dinosaurs. They discovered dinosaurs in, like, somewhere in Africa. And he goes along, and uh, he's one of the, the naysayers about it. He's great acting, great character in the in that uh, in that story. I just, I, David Warner, I, I, I can't think of anything that he's done that I didn't like. So I was, I was happy with Jor-El. Yeah, and the role is ripe for a, a big cameo appearance. And the fact that he's appearing in this hologram message form as well means that they don't have to worry about schedules for a big actor. Exactly, they yes. can just have him come in wherever, shoot his parts and be done with it. So yeah, good call for having David Warner in as uh, as Jarrell. I think I like this Jarrell a lot better than Marlon Brando. Yeah, yeah. Probably even more than uh, Russell Crowe even. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot about Russell Crowe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they really uh, like milked the Jarrell hologram thing in Man of Steel. Like, he was all <laughs> over the place. Yeah, he was everywhere, yeah. Ugh. I don't know, I liked, uh, I mean, he was, I, I liked this, for some reason, I just like uh, the way David Warner played him. He's, he seems very, like, Marlon Brando seemed very cold. You know, like, he's not, like, like I know, obviously, he's supposed to love his child and his wife, but it just didn't seem as warm as David Warner played him. Exactly, because we know that Clark 
really wanted to know about his history. He's brought it up before in the previous episodes here or there. Nothing, mm -hmm. like, they never laid it on thick, but he has brought it up before. So to get this backstory where his father was... He comes across as a, a very loving father who was just worried about the fate of Krypton and did everything he could to save his son. And he's obviously a very knowledgeable person, too. He, he had managed to get all the research on Earth and um, had deliberately sent him to... To Kansas, they actually scouted, I guess, the location where is to send him. They didn't just blindly shoot him towards Earth exactly. and let him go. So, yeah, the the fact that he is a warm and loving father who did this to save his son, I thought there was a great dimension to add to, to Superman, that he now has this knowledge. I wasn't happy that it was only going to be five times, though. You know, like when he said, this is the first of the five times, like, oh, only five? You know, I mean, like, there's so much that you could tell your kid, and it's only going to be five times. And they're not even very long, like, interactions, you know? They're, like, a minute or two at best. It's like there's so much more that you could, like, put into this information and, and into this globe and, and give to your, your son to explain more about, you know, the history of Krypton and like, like sort of like in the movies, you know, where they have like the whole history of Krypton is in those crystals, you know, like this could have been like that type of thing where he could have come back to it again and again. But I don't think we ever see the globe again. I don't even know if we see Jor-El again, actually. It is a little bit stilted, this whole five messages thing. Yeah. And it's obviously a, a means of allowing Lex to get more information about Superman. Yes. He needs to be able to find this out somehow to be a formidable enemy. So in that respect, yeah. It's a... I don't want to say MacGuffin. Yeah, it's designed to allow Lex to get information like this. Right. And even down to the part where Jack steals it from him. Yes. Like, his apartment gets robbed. You're like, seriously, Superman's apartment got robbed? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> of all the people that you could have stolen from. <laughs> yeah. And uh, fair enough. I mean, Clark goes to work every day like everybody else. So he can't mm -hmm. be everywhere at once. But yeah. So it, it's a little bit like that. A little bit like, okay, but uh, I'll give it to you because the story is interesting. Now, how is this? The kid steals it, right? But he manages to activate the globe. And then later on, after he sells it, Lex manages to activate the globe. But when Clark first, you know, when it starts glowing and Clark touches it, that's when the vision comes up. And he and Jor-El says this globe has been attuned to you. Yeah. So so how is it that Jack can do it and Lex can do it? Are they secretly Kryptonian? Are they family <laughs> of? Is it is it Lex L and Jack L? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm just like, I I didn't like that part of it. I know why they did it story wise. You know, but logically they shouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah, and also the fact that Jack activates it and Jor-El lets out a sentence. Yes. And then, of course, Jack drops it. But then later, when Lex activates it, Clark is, like, getting the message. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, so why wasn't he getting the message the first time when Jack was trying to use it? Yeah, there's there's a few little little inconsistencies here. Yeah, but like I said, I'm I'm letting it roll because it's still an interesting story. Oh, it is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's not something that brings it down for me. It's just something I'm like, well, wait a second. Hang on. Yeah, you know? we can nitpick it. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, of course, you know, after he gets that first message, he has a great scene where he flies back home to Smallville mm -hmm. and talks it out with his parents. Yeah. His adoptive parents, ostensibly. And I love the scene, the aspect of him sort of relaying what has happened and what the deal is, where he got the globe and all that. And his parents don't feel any kind of, like, animosity or stuff like that, you know, as he's right. talking about, like, oh, this message from my father and things like that. Like, Jonathan could easily be like, but I'm your father. I raised you. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. But yes. they're cool with it. They're, they're happy that mm -hmm. Clark is working out this aspect of his life, that he's getting some sort of, like, resolution. To like closure. Yeah, yeah closure. closure in his life. And they're just 100% supportive of him doing that. Oh, yeah, definitely. It just shows they're, they're good Kansas folk. That's their way. It's nice. And then, of course, uh, like we were saying, Lex comes into it. I actually love the scene of paying Jack for the globe. The word gets out, and of course, Lex is all over it. But yep. he stays in the shadows and mm -hmm. lets Nigel do the negotiating. And he gets it at a rock bottom price of $1,000. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing for him. 
I know. Wipe his butt with a thousand dollars. But yeah, I thought it played out great. Yeah, it's great because it it also protects uh, uh, Lex as well from being incriminated against anything. It's like when the guy when Jack talks to Clark, he doesn't mention really Lex; just mentions the guy with the English accent. You know, so it's yeah. Like, yeah. And they have this whole bit where Lois's old doubles partners father Mm -hmm. (laughs) louie is a guy who knows how to get things yeah he's that guy has been around like that uh, character he's a character actor he's been around many different things i've seen him before he's he was great yeah and he kind of just comes in to help them out here and there with uh, the stolen property get them in touch with jack the kid Mm -hmm. who stole it and then again like it, it plays out really nicely because clark could get like really really annoyed with jack i mean this is a huge thing for him to have stolen from him yeah yet he shows jack a sense of forgiveness mm-hmm. and feels sorry for the kid so much that he he wants to help him actually gives him his coat says you know yep. anything i can do to help you this is terrible that you and your little brother are out here on the streets and he just wants to understand what drove them to their situation so exactly again it's that development of clark and by extension, Superman's character. Mm-hmm. But of course, Lex activates the globe and he's getting all the messages, gets all the stuff. They have a great back and forth, he and Nigel, about the globe. And not only that, but Lex's collection of stuff. It's great. It's so good. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Venus de Milo arms, the full figure Mona Lisa. I just, yeah, I thought that was awesome. There, there could have been so much more that they had in there. You know, it would have been great to see like these missing parts of history. You know, I was, I was like, this is great. Yeah, it's a great little thing to sort of have in there to develop Lex's character as well. Uh-huh. To sort of see like that he keeps this stuff. Like he doesn't display it. Nobody else knows it exists. Yeah. But he's just going to keep that for himself. And he's he's sort of like a dealer in these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And now he feels completely full because he has this alien artifact and he's getting the edge on Superman. Exactly. But ultimately, Lex feels like he doesn't have all the information, right? Right. Because Mm -hmm. he knows that this is Superman's backstory. But once he has that backstory, it leads him to believe that there's more to this. That Superman isn't just a dude who shows up and does good deeds. He's been here for a long time. Yeah, I like this, that he he reasoned it out like this. After seeing some of the backstory. He's like, he's been here, you know, since he was a baby. He was sent here. You know, so he's he's one of us. He actually has a secret identity. Because up to this point... Him and, like, everybody else just assume that he just showed up when he showed up. You know, for whatever reason, he was suddenly there. You know, he was never there before. So they have – that's another reason why, you know, it, it's easy to see that maybe Lois doesn't know that Clark is Superman because Superman just sort of appeared. You know, I mean, I know Clark sort of appeared, but he's still human. He's still been around. He has this whole history of being in Smallville and all this, you know, this past where Superman just sort of like just showed up and, and, and he's like doing these amazing things. So people just sort of accept it. So this is good that he like used his brain and thought, hmm, no, now that I know this, I see he's been here forever he's had a uh, he now he has a secret identity he he walks among us i thought that was great yeah and it also has the logical play out where maybe he kind of acts too quickly in retrieving jack because he yeah. feels like that's my that's my first point of call this kid stole this from somewhere so i'll go and get him to give me information and that kind of backfires because of course the globe activates again and this time superman is ready for that and hones in and comes after lex and he has to get out of there the whole thing you know self-destruct on the vault like he's got that head and he's yeah. like nah, we're not even going to take all this like stuff that's like <laughs> super important right not nah, let all that blow up because superman is coming down here and we need to get the f out of here <laughs> this was another thing though that we've seen before you know like in sliders when they use mind control and they swipe the card on the machine and it's like a blank card and they manage to get inside anyway here superman freezes the self-destruct panel which shuts down the entire self-destruct sequence <laughs> like no nope, that's not how that's supposed to work you know you probably got to find the actual self-destruct you know bomb or whatever it is and freeze that but not not the panel the panel's just a panel yeah exactly it's not how like bombs and explosives work <laughs> it would have right. redundancies to say that like if this wire is interrupted then kaboom yeah. you know but again just just a nitpick just a nitpick yeah it's definitely one of those tv show tropes oh yeah exactly of course lex doesn't get the final message he only saw messages two through 
four, right? Two, yeah, three, and something four. Something like that. Yeah, two, three, and four. Yeah. Clark got the first one. He also gets the capper message number mm. five, which was all about you know not being abandoned, right? Being sent to Earth and all that. The stuff in the middle, you know. It, it's cool that Lex doesn't have the whole picture. He, yeah. He's got enough to move forward, but he exactly. doesn't have the whole picture. He looks at the message like it was like a condescending message or something like that. The inhabitants call it simply Earth. Ugh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good, you know. So, yeah, he has enough info to move forward, but he doesn't have the, the whole picture. Only Clark was exactly. able to experience that, which is good for Superman, but, you know... <laughs> from Lex's perspective, <laughs> it was good enough for him as well. Exactly, yeah. Even though he was, ugh, man, he was so pissy about having to leave. Like <laughs> he he was. wasn't. He's just. He wasn't worried about everything else in there that can blow up. But he, I know. he tries to get that globe like two, three times, and he just cannot reach it. I know. He's like ready to have a tantrum almost. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I want it. I want it. <laughs> and then you know the end of the episode too. Martha and Jonathan keep. Clark's globe in his fortress of solitude. Which is epic. Epic, right? It's an epic place. <laughs> it is the cubby house in the tree yes. in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's fine. Like, I, I, originally when I watched the episode back in the day, I was like, really? They're going to leave it in the tree house? You know, but then I, I, I remember they are in Kansas. They are on a farm. And like I've I've never really been like on a a real farm. Uh, I mean, I was a kid. I think we went to a farm a couple times. But like recently, you know, I went back to my girlfriend's uh, where she's from, and they grew up on a farm. And like, there's it's really pretty empty like all around them like their neighbors it's a good ways away so i guess it is okay it's it's pretty safe in there no one's really going to be just walking by and happen to notice a glowing you know light coming out of the the tree house so i think i think it, i guess it's safer than i thought originally it was just a fun little end yeah episode, it was a nice little nod to the, to the yeah comics. <laughs> exactly obviously superman doesn't have the fortress of solitude yet but right yeah it was just a cool little drop thing to make mm-hmm. her oh that's cute <laughs> <laughs> all right so some bylines here yes we have jimmy wanting to prove that he is related to cat because both of their families have been in metropolis for several generations so <laughs> yeah technically speaking they should be related so he makes a bet with her dumbest bet ever i might add that he didn't realize <laughs> that if he proves that the two of them are related <laughs> then exactly. His winnings would be null and void because yes. they're supposed to have a night of passion together. He should have reversed it is what he should have done. You know, he should have reversed <laughs> the way he was going to, you know, the, the payout. So, yeah, I was like, oh. as soon as he said it, I'm like, no, that you don't want that. You don't want to prove that you're related. <laughs> exactly. Because then you can't do that. I mean, yeah. say the other way, you know? I mean, come yeah. on. I, I thought it from the get-go. As soon as he made the bet, I'm like, but yep. if you prove you're related, then you can't do that, you idiot. <laughs> and then, of course, at the end where she goes, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> so, yeah, dumbest bet ever. Yes. How would you feel about Lois this episode getting real pissy with Clark? <laughs> it was so that funny. That he's been lying. He's like, she's like, Clark's lying to me. And Perry's like, well, don't you lie to him? Well, all the time. But, <laughs> you know, Perry's like, I'm not even going to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that was such a good little scene there. Laughed out loud. Mm, I was waiting for Clark to say something like Superman gave it to me. Like he right trusts yeah, me, me to hold on to this for him. Like right, it's not like he just has a house that he lives in. He's Superman. Like he could have said anything like that. I think that comes into play in another season where where it turns out that Clark and Superman are kind of friends. Like, they say that, like, that, that becomes a thing. I believe, I, I might be wrong, but I think there's a couple scenes where that happens in later episodes where this is, oh, yeah, he's my, you know, I, I can try to get to him, you know, but I don't know because he's doing this, doing that or whatever. But I think that comes up to play later. Like, they are friends. Yeah, it almost felt like they were, like, tiptoeing around, like, the moral of it. Right. With Clark lying to her. So can he really cover up his lie with more lies or something like that? It's like they didn't want him to lie to Lois any further or something like that. And I was like, "Eh, all right, whatever. I did like the moment with uh, with Perry trying to sort of help her talk through it. (laughs) And, of course, he (laughs) throws out there, like, I guess you're expecting me to tell an Elvis story. Well, <laughs> I'm not doing that this time. <laughs> exactly. That was pretty good. So what do you think, 
overall now of Jack because he goes to work at the Daily Planet. So I assume we're going to see him in the next couple episodes. I mean, I know, I know he's going to be in the next couple episodes because I remember that at least. I am betting that we might see him a little bit. I really don't think he's going to stick around too long. All right, because <laughs> I remember like. I, the the whole thing why he was brought in, uh, I reaction sent us a lot of info about the the actor himself. He was basically brought in because of Sequest, and uh, they had Jonathan Brandis on uh, Sequest, who was like the young teen heartthrob. And I remember that because I I watched like the first couple episodes of Sequest and just sort of like didn't get into it. But I remember him being on there, and he was bringing in the young girl demographic because he was the teen heartthrob. So they wanted someone here to bring in that teen heartthrob. Uh, a demographic for some reason i don't i mean like i reaction said in his email he's like it's like i don't know why they even worried about it because this was not a show marketed at young teen girls you know but they were they wanted to get that demographic too and jimmy uh you know the guy who plays jimmy just uh, michael landis just wasn't doing it wasn't bringing in the young girls so this was their attempt to bring in that demographic with uh with with jack i remember jack from uh the he did the adventures of jules verne show uh and i remember watching that show and i i I liked him. I liked uh, I liked this actor. I thought he was oh, I like this is cool. And it was a neat show. I enjoyed watching it each week. Uh, it, actually, trying, was it a movie or was it? I can't remember if it was a TV show or a movie now. But I remember watching it and like enjoying it. I thought he did a good job. He did other stuff. I mean that that Jules Verne show didn't last very long. He went on. He did other stuff in acting. But basically, eventually, he just gets out of acting, gets married, has kids, and now he's like the general manager for uh, some kind of resort vacation company. And he's doing good. He's fine. You know, it's <laughs> it's a, it's kind of like a anticlimactic. But yeah, he's fine. He's living a good life yeah interesting little bit of a backstory there because if i had to guess i would have said maybe they were bringing him in to sort of boost up the jimmy character a bit more because jimmy comes Mm. in and has his bit where he's like oh it's so good not to be you know the low man on the ladder anymore and stuff like that so i was like okay so that's why they brought him in right this is the new shit kicker if you will (laughs) exactly jimmy can be freed up to yeah maybe be a professional photographer for the uh right planet or something so that's what i would have guessed but you're saying they sort of going by the stuff that i reactions has uncovered for us yeah one of the young girls the preteens and yeah (laughs) Whatever. Weird. Very yeah, weird. very strange. Okay, well, I guess we should get into quote vote. What do you reckon? All righty. What's everybody standing around for? It's a newspaper. Not happy hour at Buckingham Palace. What are we here? The Daily Planet or second stringers from the Weehawken Gazette? Oh, oh, am I making myself perfectly clear? Okay, so we had another tie this week. <laughs> Real big on the ties, so I'm, I'm having to pull my hosting privileges. <laughs> it's neck and neck. <laughs> and I'm casting the uh, the vote, and it's a short one this way, but uh, right. I thought this was a funny one, so let's see how we do. Cue the music. Alan Rickman and Kermit the Frog have just watched jor message to Superman. And the inhabitants call it simply Earth. Better than cable. Much better. And the production value, sound, visual clarity. No, it's truly remarkable. Every home in America should have one. Yay! <laughs> and and see. It's his catchphrase. <laughs> I'm never going to stop doing the yay, no matter how serious it gets. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny. Yep. <laughs> uh, commenting on the production values of Jarrell's <laughs> message. Yes. That was good. Well, let's get into our second episode discussion today. The episode is The Rival, written by Tony Blake and Paul Jackson, directed by Michael W. Watkins, and this originally aired on February 27th of 1994. The sales department has just sent down this, uh, well, little reminder. But I'm going to make it easy for everybody. What it says is that ever since Preston Carpenter bought the Metropolis Star and started throwing his money around this town. The Star has been selling twice as many newspapers as the Planet, both newsstand and subscription. Can anybody explain this to me? Bigger type, smaller words? No, Lois. Carpenter's got reporters out hustling us on the street. In the last month, the Star has outscooped us on every single major news story in this town. Now, what am I going to lead off this afternoon's edition with that's going to change all that? 
Well, Secretary Wallace is in town to sign that nuclear arms treaty with Omir. We're waiting here on a one-on-one. -on -one. That'll really have him lining up at the newsstands. Lois, have you got a better idea? Police charity scams? <laughs> at least it's local. Now, people, for 50 years, the Daily Planet's been the top dog in this town, and the Metropolis Star has been this dirty little puppy nipping at our heels. Now, I don't mean to be an alarmist, but unless we get some major news stories on our own, the faces around here are going to start changing. Now, what we need is a good scandal, a crime wave. Hotel fire! That'll do. There's a woman trapped on a ledge of the Metropolitan, and the fire department's ladders can't reach her. Yes! Lois Clark, shake some tail! When the Daily Planet starts getting scooped by the Metropolis Star, Lois comes face to face with an old school nemesis, Linda King, the star's top reporter who always seems to be in the right place at the right time. Lois's extreme jealousy stems from an incident in which Linda stole not just her story, but a guy she was dating at the time as well during their college days. Things get exacerbated further when Clark quits the planet to go to work at the Star, fearing, like many others, that the planet will be going under soon and needing to reconsider his own career. It turns out that Clark and Perry had suspected that someone was actually staging the stories that Linda reported on, and so Clark went undercover to find out the truth, which is that Linda's publisher, Preston, had been staging the stories in order to make his paper the number one paper in the country, controlling what they read and think, and eventually allowing him to take over as the head of a global government. <laughs> With Linda's help, Preston's next plot to assassinate the Secretary of State is foiled while Linda and Lois manage to bury their past issues behind them. Now, who knows what's wrong with this picture? I'm going to tell you what's wrong with this picture. What's wrong with this picture is that we have no picture. Superman is the biggest story of the day. And the only picture we've got is a picture of a weather graph. Now, could someone please explain this to me? Well, Chief, the uh, first diagram illustrates the amount of rainfall we're getting this year. And the pie chart. How could you let that, that bottom feeder scoop you like this? Bottom and feeder? And what were you doing having lunch with her anyway? What are you asking him for? You want to know something? Go out and buy the star. They know everything. I bet they don't know how much rain we got this year. People, I can assure you, if we don't come up with some solid page one stories PDQ, the only writing you're going to be doing is writing your resumes. Now, what have we got? Room. Anybody? Uh, uh -huh. What in the Sam Hill am I supposed to tell my publisher if he calls? Well, whatever it is, he's waiting to hear it on line one. Just a warning, folks. I've seen papers shut down before, and it's not a pretty sight. It ain't pretty at all. Okay, so let's get into the investigation on this one. A bit more info for this. Let me go through the, uh, I'll go through the deleted stuff first. Basically, the, the Bo Jackson scene in the beginning was not scripted. In fact, in the script, all it says is Bo and Clark scene as shot. So they apparently shot the cold open and just said, we'll put this somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there was a bigger intro for Preston uh, at the dinner dance that they, whatever they go to, that little fundraiser, whatever thing it was. He's actually talking with the Secretary of State, you know, who's he's going to try to assassinate later, and they're having a back and forth thing. So it's a, you, you get to see a little bit more with him. When Linda gave Lois the wine glass and she goes out to dance with Clark, that wasn't in the script, nor was uh, Lois drinking from the uh, the wine glass. So added, you know, last minute or improvised. It was it was good, you know, sort of puts Lois down a little bit more. It's like, here you go, hang on to this, honey, you know, while I go dance with your guy. There was uh, a part where Linda walks away with Clark toward the bus, and uh, she turns around and says to Lois, bye, Lois, like very catty. You know, that wasn't in the script either. The, basically, the, the, the actress who played Linda was just playing this up, that there's like this huge rivalry, and they're just very, uh, they're just very catty with each other. So. Yeah. I think that's good. So the part where Linda comes on the Clark and says, maybe you want to get to know 
or maybe you want to define our relationship, you know, more seriously because he says their relationship isn't defined him and Lois's. And, and Clark, you know, makes a good observation that they cut out of the script. He says, this seems more about you and Lois, not really about you and me, meaning that she's sort of using him. That's a pretty good uh, analysis there by Clark because later on in the script, when Linda and Lois are together locked or tied up in the locked in the freezer, Linda says to him, well, I don't really care about Clark. I don't even like him, but you, you take him. You know, she was just using him. And they, they sort of took that out because it does it does make Linda seem really not like a nice person. Whereas the way it was aired, you can sort of sympathize with her a little bit. It's like, OK, she's not such a bad person. after Yeah, all. it's like this rivalry has developed. So that's how it is. Exactly. Kind of yeah. So when Lois and Clark argue, you know, he he leaves the uh, her apartment or whatever and he goes outside. and He smiles. But in the script, you know, he wasn't supposed to do that. He was supposed to come out and look angry, you know, but then he calms down, just looks composed, not smiles, but just calm, you know. So just a different style and acting. The thing that uh, I wanted to note here was that uh, I reactions had said, you know, the struggle when Clark tried to open the door wasn't in the script. So that was something that was added. I, I wonder if it wasn't added, but that it was just like it was a prop thing. Like he tried to open the door and the, it's a prop. So maybe the door just got stuck you know when he tried to open it i don't know if that was <laughs> supposed to be part of it you know and then they just sort of like kept rolling because you can't just cut for every little thing exactly like we have this problem but it kind of worked out to our exactly. best it looked good exactly. made the scene interesting you know later on clark knocks a vase over but uh it was supposed to be a horseman statue that uh him and linda had seen when they walked into the uh the conference and you know, he she says, "Oh, I don't like that." And Clark says, "Oh, that's actually a 14th century blah 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 blah." You know, because he's so he's smart and everything. And then uh, later on, uh, that's that, that's the statue that gets knocked over to block the door from the terrorists coming in. When Lois searches Clark's apartment, she has some lines that uh, weren't in the script. And uh, when she opens the this nothing major, like when she's saying, "Is Linda here?" Da, 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 all that stuff that was just improv, I guess, when she was looking for Linda. But when she opens up the uh, door and finds uh, Perry in there, she's like, "Okay." This is either sicker than I thought or it's not what I thought. And they cut out that line and reworded it so it wasn't quite so bad. Because I guess you don't want to offend people who... Yeah, it's you know. sort of like a little homophobic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So they, they reworded that, which was a good thing. And then uh, in the script, Lois doesn't say that she was dating Paul. She says that she just really cared for him and that Linda knew that she cared for him. That's why she took him away. So again, it just cast Linda as a, as a much meaner person than she actually turned out to be in the episode. Now, this episode was written by Tony Blake and Paul Jackson, like you mentioned, which I didn't even realize, but I reactions, because he's the god of all things sliders. They wrote Love Gods, Jillian of the Spirits, Double Cross, Dragon Slide, The Exodus, and Slither, those slider episodes. Ah. Yeah, had I didn't realize that, you know, and that's that's kind of cool to uh, to see because this is before Sliders, obviously. And some really good episodes and some that are, you know, <laughs> not so good like Slither. Uh, I reaction noted that uh, Paul actually issued a public apology for that episode of <laughs> Sliders. <laughs> As well he should, damn it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, yeah, that's that's neat to see that they actually, uh, they actually uh, worked on this show as well. Yeah, like a writing duo and they kind of went on to stuff and kind of stayed together in their yeah. writing efforts yeah exactly cool this doesn't go beyond this room you understand okay linda and i were best friends we were very competitive i know you may not believe this but there was a time when i had to be the best at everything anyway i was dating this guy paul he was an editor and was a senior and I had a really big crush on him. And things were happening and I got this story about these football players at our school that weren't taking their own exams. And I thought, this is it. This is the story that's gonna make him feel about me the way I feel about him. Did it? No, it didn't. Because somehow Linda stole my story and wrote it under her name. Of course, Paul fell for her and dumped me, and she continued to please him in ways I won't go into. So she stole a story, and she stole a guy, and now she's trying to do it again? 
Don't flatter yourself. Well, hey, don't take this out on me, Lois. Why not? You say yes to her party and yes to her lunch and yes to walking her home. You're turning into her indentured servant. Oh, so it's okay for me to be your servant but nobody else's? Clark, you are my partner, and what you do reflects on me, and I don't want the whole world to know that my partner is a doormat for women. That is not true, Lois, and you know it. You want the truth? The truth is that you're a doormat with no taste. That's fine. That's it. I'm out of here. Forget it. Fine. Perfect. Go. She's probably waiting for you. And you know, I would love to hear her side of this whole story. And I can tell her a few things about how impossible you are to work with. Really? Then why don't you work with her, too? Maybe I just will. You two deserve each other. Okay, so getting into the main story for this episode. You know, we usually start with the lead, but I think for this one, we should start with the bylines because <laughs> the right. story kind of just sticks with the story on this yeah. one. We're going to bury the lead this episode. Yeah. Bury the lead. <laughs> Let's just comment on this uh, cold open. Bo knows. <laughs> like, yeah. what the hell, man? Like, these, <laughs> these are getting worse. <laughs> they are pretty I bad. I really do not like these cold opens. They're just, <laughs> oh, they're ridiculous aren't they? Yeah, I mean, do, do you remember the Bo Knows thing that happened? I don't know who the guy is, really. Right. I, I assume he's a Harlem Globetrotter, right, because of the music. I don't know if he was a... I, I think he was... I, I remember him as a baseball player. He was like an... I know he was an athlete, and I thought he did several different sports. It may have been basketball as well. All I remember, because I, I was not... I'm not a big sports guy myself, but I knew that... And that he was he was doing commercials for Nike that it was like, you know, he would show up and say Bono's baseball or something. And it was like, you know, they would show shots of him playing, you know, baseball or something like that. So it was a whole campaign that they did with this athlete. I don't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really get the cold. Open. I'm like, I, I understand why that's funny, you know, and I think I don't even remember if those commercials were on at the time that Lois and Clark was on. I think it was like earlier than that. So it's kind of like, I don't know if people really, <laughs> aside from being a sports person, I don't think you would really get what was going on there. And it's like he said that in the, in the script, all they wrote was, you know, Bo and Clark scene as shot. So it seems like they just went out and shot a whole shitload of cold opens for Lois and Clark. Right. And they're just like putting them in randomly. Let's not even try to set up the story for some episodes. Let's just do these cold opens that we shot three dozen of or whatever. Right, exactly. We'll pull them out every time we just want to do a cold open for an episode or something. So bizarre. All right, so looking it up, it says basically Bo would appear with some other sports star. He plays baseball with some other ball player, uh, Kirk Gibson, and Kirk says, Bo knows baseball. You know, the next scene is Bo Jackson, you know, on the football field with quarterback Jim Everett. And Jim Everett goes, Bo knows football. So basically he goes through a bunch of different sports, basketball, tennis, ice hockey, professional wrestling, and they all just say, Bo knows this, Bo knows this, Bo knows this. And then, like, I guess one of the end parts is Wayne Gretzky gets – gets body checked by Bo uh, I don't know or maybe maybe Bo gets body checked by Wayne and Wayne just goes no you know he doesn't say Bo knows and then finally Bo Jackson tries to play guitar and he fails badly and Bo Diddley appears and he says Bo you don't know Diddley <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the commercial. I don't. Mm. Somehow this is supposed to sell sneakers, <laughs> <laughs> and it's supposed to draw you to Lois and Clark for some reason. I guess, yeah. Ugh. So there you go. <laughs> Weird. All right. So now that unpleasantness is out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the lead on this episode is that the Metropolis Star is crazily doing better than the Daily Planet in yes. all kinds of stuff. Street sales, subscriptions, it's just mm. overtaken the Daily Planet and they're cutting costs and stuff like that. Perry's worried that the paper is going to go under. That's how right. bad things are. And it's all about how is it that the reporters over at the Metropolis Star scooping us on everything. The neat thing that I thought was cool was the Metropolis Star, okay? In the comics, originally, Superman, or Clark Kent, I should say, worked for the Daily Star. So when the when the comics first came out back in 39 or whatever, he was working for the Daily Star, and the uh, editor was George Taylor. And then uh, that lasted for a couple issues, and then eventually it was just you know somehow just changed to the daily planet and uh the the editor was uh perry white 
then. So it does have the Metropolis Star does some, have some history, and I, I assume that they said the Metropolis Star because of the you know the Daily Star back in the comics. I'm I'm going to assume that's like a, an homage to that. And there's a lot of if if you look up the whole Daily Star and the George Taylor thing, there's a lot of history there with the multiverse of DC and everything. It's it's pretty fun to listen to how in the in the Daily Star Perry White was was like their top reporter, you know, and never never became a editor or, or whatever in that particular storyline. It's, it's pretty cool to read about. Yeah, I wish they'd given the other newspaper uh, a more grander name, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's cool that they're sort of, you know, maybe tying it back to those early Superman mm-hmm. things with the star. But the fact that it's called the Metropolis Star would lead you to believe that it's a more localized paper. Exactly. Whereas the, the Daily Planet. <laughs> yes goes everywhere everybody gets that you know across america across the world now not to jump ahead okay but preston carpenter has this uh idea of like taking over what everybody reads all right but like he says if he can like sink the daily planet and take over he'll control over what 90 percent of the world reads and i just didn't assume that the, that the Daily Planet had that big a circulation. Like, I really, I know it does say the Daily Planet, and it, it seems like it could be the whole world, but I just sort of always assume the Daily Planet is just sort of focused in Metropolis itself, because that's where it is, and that's, you know, it's usually how it works. Yeah, well, um, there are newspapers that are globally syndicated, right? Yeah, there are some, yeah. I, just, I, I never thought of that being one. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that's just kind of what they're setting up here. And like yeah. I said, just having the Metropolis star kind of does make it seem like it's a bit more localized. But then I guess when you think about this, like the New York Times and stuff like that, a lot of people get that. True. That's more global because of like Wall Street and stocks. Like, you know, yes. that kind of has a lot of that sort of information in there. So that's right. why that can be a bit more global. But yeah, I don't know. It just, yeah, it kind of just made it seem a bit more localized than it should be. So maybe if it had a grander name like the Daily Planet, it would make a bit more sense. But, uh, yeah, they're getting scooped at every turn, and uh, it's not looking good for the planet because, yeah, they are just cutting budgets and everything. But then there's an apartment fire, (laughs) and Perry's so excited. Yeah, let's get over there. (laughs) Cut to the apartment fire, and, of course, Clark doesn't run off to it. He has to get something from his desk, (laughs) quote-unquote. Superman shows up and stops the fire, but Linda King shows up there. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, she gets the scoop and a quote from Superman. And this sets up the rivalry between yes. Lois <laughs> Lois and Linda. So what did you think of this, this uh, rivalry that they had going on? Oh, it was well done. It was well done. It didn't seem forced at all. You know, like I thought it was good. And Lois coming up at the end, you know, it's like, w- w- where's, where's Superman? What happened? Oh, it's already done. I got my quote. You know, <laughs> you'll see it in our paper tomorrow or, whatever, or later. So, yeah, I thought it was, it was definitely well, not it, like it. It felt natural. You can definitely tell they have a history. Yeah, I, I can say that about the whole story for this yeah. episode, really. It felt very natural, a mm-hmm. good progression, a good reveal of what was happening. Because they introduced the editor for the Metropolis Star, yes. this guy Carpenter. And he comes in and he's talking about Citizen Kane and these delusions of grandeur controlling what people read, pushing your own agenda. And then what you alluded to in your plot summary there, <laughs> this mustache twirling <laughs> ploy <laughs> to take over the world. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty rough. He even has this like super obvious philosophy when he talks about his paper. We don't wait for things to happen. We make it happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when you think back on it, you're like, yeah, I really should have seen this coming. Like, <laughs> exactly. this, this guy's behind the whole thing. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will say I do like I, I do like the actor who plays Carpenter because that is uh, Dean Stockwell. And he's been in other things as well. But, of course, the, the biggest thing that I remember him from Quantum Leap. Yeah, from what I mean, I haven't seen Quantum Leap, but I, from what I know, he plays like the guy who sort of like monitors the travels or something, right? Right, right. He's right there with him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, like I said, it, this whole story just unfolds naturally. We cut to Clark having lunch with Linda, um, of course, deepening the rivalry between Lois and Linda. And there is this elevator that starts crashing down. 
And yep. then, of course, Superman has to jump in and save the day again. And it's this slow progression as they try to figure out, like, okay, the cable snapped, but it looks like it was cut. Mm-hmm. And then earlier with the apartment fire, Linda just happened to be, you know, the next block over having lunch or whatever. It just slowly unfolds and they kind of figure out what's happening here. Well, yeah, and she always gets a phone call right before something happens. You know, from her editor to make sure that she's in the right place. Make sure you keep your cellular telephone with you at all times. (laughs) Exactly, yes. (laughs) Definitely dates the episode a little bit with that cell. And they even dig a bit deeper because they find that there are two separate articles in the afternoon edition of the Metropolis Star. And they think, like, oh, it's crazy. Like, they'd be pushing it to get that one story out. You know, she managed to scoop them and get that one story. But now there's the second story in there that the editor himself wrote up. (laughs) Right, right. Right. And you're like, yeah, this seems more like it would be a follow-up thing in the next issue of the paper or something, once a bit more information had been gathered by the newspaper itself. So It seems very old school to have different editions of the newspaper, like the morning edition, the, the afternoon edition. Like, that seems, like, not cost-effective. I mean, good for getting the news out right away. Like, you know, back in the old day, read all about it, you know, the kid on the, the corner and everything. But I don't. do they still do that today, I wonder? Oh, I doubt it. Internet right. age and all that. There'd be no need to be right. doing two issues of a paper <laughs> exactly. every day. Yeah. Then we have this scene where Linda goes to dinner with Carpenter. Yeah. And he has, like, the worst dinner conversation ever, right? When he's <laughs> yeah. talking about Charles Foster Kane and stuff, and then he's uh, just, like, creepily putting his hand on hers and everything. Like, yeah. he is coming on strong, and yes, he has yes. no idea that she just has no interest in him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, a, like, even Lex knows when Lois is, like, giving him the cold shoulder. <laughs> this dude exactly. is, like, off the walls. Like, he has <laughs> no idea. And then Clark turns coat. Yes. He gets in a huge argument with Lois and she reveals the impetus behind her relationship with Linda Mm -hmm. that she had stolen her boyfriend. It's like he was saying in the in the trivia about this that they kind of had this thing where he wasn't really her boyfriend but she liked him and stuff like that. I think that might have muddled this a little bit because I kind of got the same thing like it felt like she was saying that he was her boyfriend but then later when she's talking to her in the freezer it was more like they weren't really dating but they were going to date and stuff and I, I I thought that maybe was a little bit muddled. Yeah, just a little bit. But the you know the fact that her and Clark get in an argument about this, and he's going to go and work for the Metropolis Star. Did you get what was going on here? I had a feeling. Yeah, like I, I'm trying to remember back when I first saw it, but I think I had a feeling. There's no way he would really leave. You know, it's like come on, he's got to be at the Daily Planet. So I had a feeling mm-hmm. that it was just a, it was a ploy. Yeah, and I think that smile as he walked away from her apartment after exactly. the argument really gave it away. Mm-hmm. Yep. I kind of wish they'd kept it a bit more ambiguous. Right, right. It's like, why is he smiling? They just had an argument, you know? We haven't seen this in a few episodes, but it sends Lois... (laughs) crazy <laughs> yeah thinking that she's lost Clark and when she shows up at his apartment going ape shit <laughs> where is she I know she's here is she under the bed is she under the bed <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny scene yeah and finding Perry there and then trying to backtrack over the fact that she had all these emotions I thought it just played for uh, for a couple of great scenes oh yeah definitely well done and then they actually turned to Linda and bring her in on it. So how'd you feel about this? The fact that Lois was like relishing the thought that maybe Linda was in on it. But exactly. Clark's like, I don't think so. And then they bring her in. Yeah, that was good because, you know, they don't, she just wants to find any reason to hate on uh, on Linda. So she's like, she's got to be in it. But now Clark's like, no, it's, it's probably just Carpenter. Uh, and so they go to her with this information. And of course, she had no idea. And, and you can understand her wanting to help them because, you know, she wants to to be valued on her assets as a reporter as well you know so for someone just to to make up stories so she can get the story easily is like you know she, that bothers her too so it's good that you know she turns around and she works with them uh, but they still have their little back and forth her and lois but yeah they're working together now which is cool yeah i do think they need to give 
Linda the opportunity to show that she is a good reporter. Because exactly. Because before she teams up with them, we do kind of think of her as, you know, this is all just set up for her to be able to report on it because that's where she is. And then later when she's working with Clark, they go to this press conference thing and all you really see of her as a reporter is get in an argument with Lois. Exactly. <laughs> like, a, like a girl fight kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And Clark has to stop this robbery that's going to take place. Again, she's just there by convenience. So the fact that, yeah, she does team up with Lois and Clark and get involved as a proper reporter, it's just, I think, a bit better for her character, especially oh, yeah. since she wasn't really involved in this evil ploy at all. Definitely. But of course, the whole thing, yes, the government to rule all governments. I know. I was like, what? I guess. Whatever. Yeah. You're going to be leader of the world, take over the world, like Dr. Evil or something. Exactly. And somehow he's going to do this by assassinating a cabinet member. Right. Uh, yeah. (laughs) Sure. It starts the dominoes falling, I suppose, I guess, somehow. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, and of course they're un- they're able to uncover this because he's like pre-written the story for the paper and everything ready to yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. And Linda sort of manages to distract him with her feminine wiles and all that jazz. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Clark has to. G- <laughs> Clark has to go off and be Superman Mm -hmm. to save this cabinet minister, leaving Lois and Linda alone. (laughs) And, of course, be captured and left to freeze to death and give them the chance to bury the hatchet. Right. I thought this was a good little play. Sort of reminded me of the episode... From last week that we watched with, what was her name, Police Detective? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Reed. Reed. Her and Lois had a bit of a thing. So a that's little right. bit like that. Yeah. Kind of copying things. But, yeah, it sort of let them bury the hatchet, but not really. Mm-hmm. They still kind of have this friendly rivalry going right, on exactly. by the end, right? It's not as mean-spirited as it was in the beginning. Yeah. I thought it was quite funny, you know? Superman stops the assassination, of course. And then Linda comes in, and she's like, oh, you know, I'm no longer <laughs> working for the Metropolis Star. But, oh, I did manage to sell the film rights to my story. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm actually getting a small role, Lois. I'll try to do you justice. <laughs> I thought that was good. Yep. <laughs> she gets to play Lois. So, no, it was good. It was, it was both of these episodes I thought were fun. You know, they're fun episodes. There's a lot of good stuff in them. Definitely liked them more than the, the previous ones that I was sort of like, meh. Yeah, I agree. A lot of fun, these uh, two episodes, for sure. Life is cruel. <sighs> don't get philosophical. It's never your strength. Well, don't you find it ironic that you and I have to die together? We were best friends. Were. Okay. Let's clear this up once and for all. Let's not. And if there is someone on the other side that asked, we'll just say we did. You think I stole Paul Bender from you? I didn't. You weren't even dating him. I was dating him. I was dating him. He came on to me. Well, you had no willpower, huh? None. I would have done anything for Paul. Just like you had no willpower when you stole my story. Okay. Okay. So, So I was weak. It doesn't mean I wasn't a good friend. It just means that I wasn't as strong as you. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. You're backing into an apology by arguing that you stole my guy and my story because you were under the influence of your hormones and because I was your best girlfriend at the time. I was supposed to forgive you then and I'm not supposed to make a big deal of it now. Is that what you're saying? Right. Ah! Okay. (coughs) I forgive you. Okay, so let's get into the back issues. We do have a little bit room. A little bit. There wasn't much, again, in those uh, old forms. Still, the technology hasn't caught up yet to the time, or or it wasn't just, wasn't just quite widely available, I guess. So one person did post, and they were wondering why Laura didn't have anything to say, uh, you know, in the scenes from the Globe. And basically, you know, I'm, I'm saying it's because, you know, it's a flashback told by jor You know, he's the one narrating, so she's obviously not going to say anything. You know, it's just a... It's like putting a video camera, you know, in the room and then you narrate afterwards. So that's yeah. why uh, that's why Laura was just silent. Plus, they probably didn't want to waste their whole production budget on exactly. getting two <laughs> guest stars. Exactly. <laughs> when we could only pay one. 
on and have him say everything. <laughs> they did. They did say that she did look like the actress from the Christopher Reeve movies, though. She was. Uh, she looked a little similar to that. I was like, oh, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Different hairstyle, but you know. Um, and then the same person, which I don't get what they were asking about here, was like, how come? Why doesn't Superman have anything else to wear? He's always wearing the same thing. I'm like, that's his costume. What are you talking about? You know, what else would he change <laughs> into? You know, and it's someone his brand. else. Yeah, exactly. Someone <laughs> jumped in and said, exactly. I want to see him wear nothing at all. I'm like, oh gosh. All right, ladies. <laughs> yeah, who is he? Dr. Manhattan all of a sudden? Just exactly. Let it swing free. There you go. <laughs> but that's it for now for back issues. And a couple of things in the uh, the personal ads from our Facebook page. Yeah, we got uh, we we mentioned uh the uh the Lois and Clark podcast and uh, how Lorianne Collins was on there and, and had mentioned about the whole telephone thing with Jonathan and Martha and you know she uh, she posted on our Facebook page and said hey thanks for the shout out I recently discovered your podcast and have been catching up on episodes love the format particularly when you compare script to screen it's like having a film spotting breakdown analysis of the show so keep up the good work guys and yeah that, that's a fun thing to look at the scripts and uh, you know see how they differed you know what, what they changed and all that and like we said we did that since the, uh, the sliders days because there was a lot of stuff that was cut out of the slider stuff you know a lot of the science that we wanted to have in the science fiction was cut out unfortunately so L- less so here in these in these scripts yes and of course thanks as always to why reactions our official mm-hmm. rewatch podcast investigator yeah we're gonna we're working on having him uh come up on an episode uh, make a guest appearance on one of the uh, episodes if we can and uh andrew zur as well he's been uh you know he's been on the uh, quote votes and stuff like that but he also wrote uh i'm currently listening to this ep guys good work as always i really need to start re-watching this series and i completely agree andrew i think you <laughs> really should be watching it yes <laughs> and uh it's great that you're voting on the quote vote but at least you can watch the episode and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> remember the quote that you're voting for yes but yeah yeah we love people quote voting and stuff like that and we love your feedback so yeah come over to the facebook page we're going to give out our info in just a minute uh, of uh, all the other ways you can contact us but yeah we love to hear from you guys out there all right the next issue we will be discussing that man and fly hard mm. right, now i was sort of spoiled a little bit on that man so i'll let you say what you think that man's gonna be about <laughs> i've got no idea <laughs> <laughs> a man who gets trapped in a vat as a small boy <laughs> and then uses the image of said vat <laughs> to instill fear in the hearts of the wicked he got it in one yes that's <laughs> Yeah, no, it, you know, both of these obviously seem like plays on, like, Batman and Die Hard. Mm-hmm. But um, Batman, I, I uh, was reading the, the review over at Superman homepage, and, yeah, it, it, it does have to do with that, uh, that clone that we had mentioned, I think, an episode ago. Oh, okay. What's that got uh, yeah. to do with vats? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's how he's created. <laughs> Is he created in a vat, in I a guess? Vat. A big old vat. <laughs> like know. a piece of mold growing on the side yeah, of it. Exactly. Say you know? there's a Superman growing in my mold. <laughs> no, there's mold growing on my <laughs> Superman. Uh, and then Fly Hard, I don't know. I can't imagine. Like, Is it going to be like a heist thing, like Die Hard, you know, where someone takes over? It's Die Hard with a superhero. You know, like Spade is Die Hard in a bus. Wasn't there an episode where someone took over the Daily Planet and they were all stuck in the Daily Planet and he couldn't change his Superman because he's in the Daily Planet with everybody? Oh, uh, maybe. Maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Uh, could be, could be. Like a bottle episode, too. Yeah, you know, exactly. Where just shoot the whole thing on the Daily Planet set as well. Right. Keeping that production budget low. Well, we'll find out next week because that's it for this issue of the Rewatch Podcast. Keep up with listener interaction by liking our Facebook page at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast or facebook.com slash Lois and Clark Rewatch. And follow the show on Twitter at Rewatch Pod. Don't forget you can visit our webpage at rewatchpodcast.podomatic.com, which has some of our links there to our favorite sites as zoomway.net, the folc.wiki.com, supermanhomepage.com, plus links to our archive of the film Rewatch watch episodes and remember as always you can write us an email or record a voice message and send it over to the rewatch podcast at gmail.com and also if you've enjoyed the show please consider giving us a rate and review on itunes helps people find us a lot better thank you in advance for that and you can help 
support us even further by heading over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast and making a monthly contribution as little as one dollar helps us keep the lights on around here so thank you extremely much for that and of course we are forever striving to reach 100 subscribers <laughs> On YouTube, we have links on our Facebook, or you can just search Rewatch Podcast and Lois and Clark or Sliders or something like that, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Very mm -hmm. much appreciated. All right, well, thank you for joining me again, Tom. Yep. And I will just say, until next time, precision and care are the watchwords. <laughs> we gotta fly. The Rewatch Podcast is not associated with Warner Brothers Television, ABC, Gangbuster Films Incorporated, or round delay productions. Don't believe everything you see on TV. The use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in United States Code Title 17, AKA Fair Use. Let's get legal on this. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Great shades of Elvis. Copyright 2016. The Rewatch Podcast. Where your beepers, we'll be in touch. Hi, Rewatch Podcast listeners. I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. First off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch Podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this for you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So, we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them so head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast and if we get enough patrons we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support the website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast thanks everyone